As we get into that, pre-sermon, not, not actually taking off on the Word yet, um, the reason for this uh, image ha- is because this has been in my head for months. Um, this was actually birthed doing a sermon in my office a few weeks ago. Whenever I wasn't traveling and COVID had kind of knocked everything out, I was doing sermons every week in my office right down the street, um, just me in front of a camera. You probably saw those on YouTube. Um, that is an interesting way to do ministry. Um, even if there's just a handful of us in the room, you can connect with a handful of people and the Holy Spirit is not restrained. Like he can do amazing things just between two people, three people, four people. But when it's you and a camera, (laughs) um, there's no one to grab hold of and there's no one to connect with. So, um, that was an interesting time, although out of that, something started really stirring in me. Something started really happening in that those sermons were starting to tap into some things I hadn't said before. Um, I felt safe to say them because I wasn't saying them to people. I was saying them to an inanimate object, even though I knew they're going to be seen by people. There's an odd disconnect you can do there when you're teaching where you actually start to say some things. I probably wouldn't say that if there was two or three people in here. But, you know, there's nobody in here. And then there's just as many people that are watching that one as would watch the one. I know it doesn't make sense, but it's kind of the way your, your brain thinks in those moments. But that opened me up. It kind of let me throw off the, the restraints of the room and connecting with people and just go, okay, say that. And so that happened pretty frequently through June and July as I was just doing that every week. I kind of really got in the groove where I liked it. I liked hearing from the Lord on it, working it over for a day or two, recording it. And, and during that, those sessions, um, the idea began to, to weigh on me that we have had this movement of grace that has liberated people and, and done more to change my life than... than anything I've ever experienced, the revelation of the finished work and the love of God. But what has transpired has been almost a a downplaying of some of the ministry of Jesus while propping up things like the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And I would hear and, and, and encounter enough incidents of, well, Jesus was in the old covenant when he said that. You need to go over here and see what the apostle Paul says under the new covenant. And that's really started to weigh on me. Like, why would we devalue the words of literally the founder of our faith? I mean, we are not followers of Paul. And so so those of you who are watching my stuff in the summer, you heard me say things like this. We're not disciples of Paul. We're not disciples of Peter. We're not disciples of John. We're not even disciples of the New Testament. We're... Followers of Jesus exclusively, in fact. The other stuff is peripheral and and complementary, and they can help really support what we believe, but we don't live and die by what Paul says or live and die by what James says. And I know that's a fine line, and I'm not in our lesson yet. I'm I'm doing this up front just to kind of talk this out of why this is happening. Um, There's kind of a fine line you walk when you get into that ground because you don't want to devalue the Bible You don't want to devalue the scripture. You don't want to say to people, um, well, James didn't have this revelation and Paul had, you know, that's tough. And you start to walk that road because then you're like, well, what do you trust? You know, you're reading the scriptures. What do you trust? Um, At the same time, Jesus admits, Jesus says, there's a lot of stuff I want to say to you, but I can't say it because you're not ready because you don't have the Holy Spirit. When you get the Holy Spirit, I'm going to be able to say more. And And so we know he does through Paul, particularly Paul, who writes two-thirds of the New Testament under this anointing to to expound on truths about covenant and about liberty and about grace that are never found in the Word. But that doesn't mean, because we have this great outpouring of knowledge through someone like Paul, that we can devalue Jesus and take his sayings as if they don't matter. So that was part of it. That was part of what birthed this in me. The other part was where I began to have a real revelation of revelation 
and the slain lamb Jesus with a sword coming out of his mouth. And I preached that and taught that a lot throughout the summer and into the fall. No sword in his hand in the Bible, but a sword in his mouth, which tells me that the Jesus of Revelation and the Jesus that we serve is not a Jesus who swings his sword in violence and vengeance and, re- and revenge, but a Jesus who speaks his victory from, a, from something. And that's the great journey. But there's an effort to silence that, to close the mouth that holds the sword and transfer the sword to his hand. And what has happened is Jesus has been co-opted by, a, by an image draped in flags and tanks and missiles that allows a God of military vengeance to come and exact heaven's justice on the earth. And I think we've silenced the lamb too long who puts a sword in his mouth, not in his hand. So that's part of why I want to go down this journey. Um, and another reason I, and these are, these are these peripheral, these are these little offshoots of what has birthed this. I do an essay this next week on Wednesday's podcast, my essay edition, where I laid this whole thing out, this whole framework of why I'm doing this set. Um, Another is that we have silenced Jesus for too long on what he really said about his return. And we have silenced Jesus for too long about what he said about our role in the kingdom. And so I want to take the tape off the lamb's mouth and let him do what he does, because out of his mouth the logo speaks. The worlds are changed. Chaos is set to order. Release the lamb and let him do what he wants to do. And maybe there might be a book that rolls out of this. I don't know. But I wanted to approach this differently than I ever have um, when I wrote books on subjects or whatever. I wanted to just preach it and teach it in an atmosphere of people that I'm not trying to lay foundations out every week. So if I go to North Carolina, I don't know anyone. I mean, I know six people, you know, and there's 150 of them or 200 of them. And I've got to qualify stuff all the time. And I got to prop things up all the time. And I got to relay foundations. I don't have to do that in this room. And so there's a lot of stuff we can just work on and work through. And then when we get to the end of it every month, I can hear from you and get that immediate feedback to go what that says to me or dwell on that and then work on it again the next month and say, hey, we've had four weeks to I'm rolling over the thoughts for what we're going to do this month. What have you thought about what happened last month or what the Holy Spirit say to you? So I'm kind of using you as a, as a experimental testing grounds for this. All right. As we go and, uh, and just to have some fun with it and see what the Holy Spirit does. I know the first five or six areas I want to go. And then just, I don't know, after that, just kind of let them brew. You know, I'm so accustomed to doing John Tuesdays. I got a, turn the page, start thinking of next Tuesday, but then usually a weekend that interrupts that two, three, four, five sermons that's got to be done in some state. So John gets put off till Monday, you know, and so then always kind of next thing, next thing, then podcast, 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 podcast. And so it's, it's refreshing to me to go, okay, you got four weeks to lay this next one out on this and just let that stuff sort of ruminate and stir over. So that I won't give that whole speech every month. I just wanted you to know why I'm doing this, all right? I just wanted you to know what this is about and why, I, why I'm excited about these monthly meetings for the next several months to see how this series unfolds, but also to enjoy your company, as I've looked forward to this um, all week long, this, these moments where we get to be together. So, all right, let's get started. Um, I want to, we, we are going to use, um, Lauren is running PowerPoint tonight, so we will be using scriptures only on our screen. I'm not doing any, any, and that may be this way every month, I don't know, but I'm not doing any statements or Greek Hebrew definitions in this particular lesson. So we'll only use it for scripture because I was pretty sure that no one would bring their Bible. Um, and so because I've, I, I've kind of trained you to have the screen. That's on, that's on me. That's not on you. So I wanted to use that to, to give you some help. So let's get started on what I'm titling t- today, God Provides a Lamb. Because I want to start with the imagery of the lamb as, as a feature of the Bible from, from the beginning of it to the end of it. You could say that the Bible sort of bookends itself with imagery of the lamb. And if you were going to found a faith and you were going to use an image of an animal to found that faith, nations do this all the time. America does this. There was a big debate 250 years ago in America over what our national bird would be. 
Benjamin Franklin advocated for the turkey because he thought it was native to North America, it was regal, it was beautiful, it was colorful. Benjamin Franklin lost the debate. We went with the bald eagle, which likes to eat dead things. Um, but when you're looking at imagery, you're not looking at the details necessarily of the image. That was Ben Franklin's problem. He was preaching the details. He didn't think about a big fat bird called a turkey that would be the national symbol. And that's not going to play as well as this bold eagle will play, even though in the details, he's probably right. We're probably more the turkey than we are the eagle. But it's the image that matters because the image portrays something on the surface. There's a lot of stuff beneath it. Sure, if you dig. And we're going to dig into the image of the Lamb because some of it is very much us. Some of it is very much our Lord Jesus. Some of it is very much the cross. Some of it is insulting when you think of the image of the Lamb. And some of it um, doesn't work too well for our theology. But we're not peeling the onion back on it. We're talking about imagery. And the image of the Bible when it comes to showing God in human flesh, is decidedly a lamb. It's a sheep. Um, at its apex form, Jesus is a shepherd over a bunch of sheep. We collectively identify with him as lamb. So again, though there's details in there that we may or may not like, what is presented forward is the image of something that has no defense mechanism, something entirely innocent, something that is never predator, always prey, something that relies on a shepherd to protect it, to lead it, to guide it, to carry it. A sheep can't even cross a body of water by itself. It has to be transported from point A to point B. Um, it has to get in a boat to go to the other side. Um, there, there's so much of that imagery that, that is laid out in front of us that has all these great deep theological connections. I want to try to take you through some of the scriptures left to right to show us that image and then we'll, we'll work on some of the details of it because we have to lay Jesus out in front of us as a lamb and what that looks like in order to really get into the heartbeat of what it says. Here's our first reference in the Bible to this image of the Lamb. Genesis chapter 22, verses 7 and 8. This is the moment, and we're going to read this entire story at the end today. But for the start, I want to take you to the heartbeat of it. This is really where it, really where it gets its legs. It's where it makes something happen for us in Christianity. Isaac says to Abraham, his father, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. He said, look, we have the fire, we have the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And you know the story. You know that this is where God says, Abraham, go take your son, your only son, to the top of the mountain and sacrifice him. And Abraham takes Isaac up the hill. And Isaac catches on halfway up the mountain and says, hey, we got everything, but where's the lamb? And there's the Bible's first reference to this lamb. If you didn't know what was coming in the Bible... You're just reading this thing brand new. You just stumble into 22 and you get this story. There's no way that there's no foreshadow yet that the lamb is a big deal until you hear what Abraham says in verse 8. My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. And from this point on, the Bible has laid out one statement for you that seems like a passing thought in a conversation between a dad and his kid on the way up a mountain. But it becomes more than a passing comment. It becomes the heartbeat of everything the Bible is going to do from this point on. God will provide himself a lamb. And there is the Old Testament sort of shouting into the consciousness of the reader, watch what God's about to do. God shall provide himself for a lamb. Now, Bible scholars have gotten big fights over the Hebrew right here for a long, long time. Um, it's worth me mentioning. It's not worth fighting over. But they've been in big discussions as to what the Hebrew is actually trying to say, which is, is the Hebrew saying God will provide for himself a lamb? Or is the Hebrew saying God will provide himself as a lamb? We don't really know because the Hebrew is not word to word to the English. And in some ways, we're filling in the gaps of the sequence. And so 
it really works either way for us in Christianity. Either God provides for himself a lamb or God provides himself as a lamb. But that's our hint that this whole story is going to be about God providing himself a lamb. Because there are the, the, the idea of animal sacrifice is as ancient as the scriptures and far more ancient. That people have been offering up living things, animals and humans, as sacrifices to the gods, to appease the gods, to please the gods. And those gods were most always represented in nature, rain, food, storms, fertility, whatever to appease the gods. Abraham doesn't even argue when God says, take your son, your only son up the mountain to sacrifice him. Abraham doesn't go, oh, no, I can't kill my own kid. We don't kill kids. Abraham came from a kid killing culture, by the way. The Ur of the Chaldees sacrificed children in the fire to their gods. So when God says to Abraham, bring your kid up here and sacrifice him, Abraham goes, okay. That's what you do for gods. And he drags Isaac up the mountain. But remarkably, Abraham on the way up that mountain has this revelation of God's going to take care of the lamb issue. And I can't help but believe that's the great moment of faith in the Bible in which not only is Abraham came out of the land of his fathers and into a new land, but it's that moment where Abraham says, son, don't worry. The book of Hebrews says it this way, by the way. Abraham knowing that God would raise him from the dead, took him on up the mountain. In other words, he walked him up that mountain going, and we have no reason to believe in resurrection in Genesis 22. There's never been a resurrection in Genesis 22. And yet here's Abraham going, God's got this, God's got this taken care of. And it's a beautiful way for the Bible to kick off the redemption story. Don't worry, God shall provide for himself a lamb. And even if that lamb dies, God shall provide for himself a resurrection. So whether you knew it or not, in Genesis 22, you have crucifixion, resurrection foreshadowed long before we ever get out of the Old Testament. And that's the journey that we're on. So Israel, if you were to leave from here, and I don't take you scripture to scripture, I just want to take you there sort of ideologically rather than screen wise. We'll jump to another one in just a moment. But I want you to think about how that progresses as Israel becomes a sacrificially based nation and they go down into the slavery of Egypt and in the slavery of Egypt, as they're being delivered from Egyptian bondage, God tells them to take an innocent, spotless lamb and sacrifice it as a Passover lamb. And God tells them to do this for four days. They are to take the lamb into their house and raise it. And then on the fourth day, they are to kill it as a sacrificial lamb. Think about that. Go choose a lamb and then take care of it for four days and then offer it up as a sacrifice. And the reason behind that is because if you take a sweet little innocent spotless lamb into your house, you, your family, your kids, and you raise it for four days in your house, what happens to everyone in that house? They fall in love with that little lamb. And that was the point. So that you were not just willy nilly offering up something you could pay for. Oh, we gotta go get a lamb? All right, let's go get a lamb. Here, here's a few bucks take it out behind, away from my sight, and kill it on our behalf. That wasn't good enough. God wanted a connection to the sacrifice because he wanted you to know what it felt like to give up something so that you could honor what God gives up at Calvary. So you took the lamb into your house for four days. You loved this little lamb. And then on the fourth day, you had to offer it up as a blood sacrifice to God and then eat it. That's an that's a incredible little caveat to the Passover story is that you offered up what you had fallen in love with and then you consumed it. And this would all become a type and shadow of the reality that Jesus would be embraced and loved by those who called him their own and then they would have to be a party in his death, see his death and his resurrection. And so the lamb takes on bigger than just bloodshed. It takes on... It takes on a, a sense of ownership. There's the word I'm looking for. It takes on a sense of ownership that, that it belongs to you and therefore it's being sacrificed by you. So that the sacrificial system wasn't cheap. So that Israel held on to that system of sacrifice. And so 
Israel begins to see the collective nation represented in that lamb. That's the Passover lamb. So every year, whenever they offer up their own lambs or when they offer up the goat or the bullocks, all these animals become representative of all of us represented in one thing. Therefore, Jesus can become the all of us represented in one thing. Here's how Isaiah, now we're about halfway through the scriptures. And so Isaiah says this in 53 verses 6 and 7. Isaiah 53, by the way, is a Calvary chapter. I'm going to take this off because I'm getting warm. It's a Calvary chapter. And what Isaiah 53, our Jewish brothers don't read Isaiah 53, by the way. Um, they, they skip that one in their text because we, we consider this the Jesus chapter or the Calvary chapter. But look at the descriptions of him in 6 and 7. All This starts with us because remember I said Israel looked at the lamb as the collective. So they had the one lamb that was everybody. So Isaiah says this, all of us like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All of us are the ones who have strayed. There's the collective. And then God lays on what is all of our issue. He lays on one the iniquity of us all. So this is the Old Testament concept of that lamb image being thrust forward into one individual. All right? that collective lamb in image. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Voluntary silence. Because we're going to cover that in the coming months as well. Jesus sometimes silenced himself when it would have been more expedient in the natural realm to talk. But learning when to be silent is one of the great arts of following the Spirit. All right, And when we get into that lesson, we'll go back to the John 8 where Jesus doodles in the sand because sometimes you need to learn to be quiet in order to learn what to say. And Jesus was a master at that. He understood when to silence. One of the places he silences is at the cross. He's led. He doesn't open his mouth and he's led. Here comes the lamb image. He's led as a lamb to the slaughter. He's led as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So Jesus did not open his mouth. Now, when you look at what Jesus does here, it's, it's, we, I say Jesus. I'm, I'm interpolating because Isaiah never says Jesus. Okay? Granted. But when we see the cross, we can't help but see Jesus in Isaiah 53. All right? I know I'm, I'm preaching backwards. You have to when you read that scripture if you're a Christian because you know what's coming. But if you're taking this left to right, you're progressing this through the Old, Old Testament text. When you get to this passage, think about what the lamb has represented, this thing that you love, that you put your heart into, and that is then sacrificed. And then, then this prophetic character becomes that lamb. And all of our strayings get placed into that one lamb. And therefore, that lamb becomes representative of everyone else. So then we get to the Jordan River. In John chapter 1, John the Baptist is baptizing people and says... In 129, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What gives John the right to say this? He doesn't have an Old Testament scripture that says the Lamb of God will take away the sin of the world. He doesn't have an Old Testament prophetic scripture that calls one person the Lamb of God. In fact, the Lamb of God isn't even a phrase. Or is it? Genesis 22. Hey, Dad, we've got the knife. And we've got the fire. And we've got the wood. But where's the offering? Son, don't worry. God shall provide Himself a lamb. And then the Old Testament, which just dwells on lambs dying on our behalf, Ignores that until that Isaiah 53 moment. He's like a sheep led to the slaughter. He's like a sheep in front of his shears. And John the Baptist gets rid of the simile. And he doesn't say, behold one like a lamb. He says, behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. 
What sin of the world might he be talking about? He must have the Isaiah 53 image in his head. All of we like sheep have gone astray. And the Lord has laid on one person the iniquity of everybody. And the one person that God laid all the iniquity on goes into his death like a lamb in front of the slaughter. He goes into his shears like a lamb who opens not his mouth. And John says, I found him. Behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So though John doesn't have one single verse in the Old Testament, from which to say, there's a lamb of God. He has a collective idea. God's supposed to provide himself a lamb. Somebody's going to be a lamb on our behalf. And the one that comes is going to be unlike anybody else. He's going to keep his mouth shut when everybody else would open their mouth. And he's going to walk right into his death when everybody else would run from it. And there's something unique about this individual. And the fact that John spots it and Jesus hasn't performed one miracle, Jesus hasn't opened any eyes of the blind. He hasn't multiplied any food. He hasn't walked on the water. Is a testament that is so impressive to Jesus that Jesus says to his audience later in his ministry, the greatest prophet that ever lived was John the Baptist. Why did Jesus say John was the greatest prophet? Because John made the one connection that the Old Testament hoped somebody would make. God shall provide himself a lamb. And John said... I think God has. And even though John kind of waffles, he roller coaster rides his faith throughout his ministry. Here's John at a peak. Behold the Lamb of God. I can't take it. I, I'm not even worthy to take his shoes off. Uh, no, you don't bap- I don't baptize you. You baptize me. And then John sends people to Jesus and goes, are you the, really the one or should we look for somebody else? Because I don't know if you're really the Messiah or not. And, and so you get this little bit of... And that, and that tells me a roller coaster faith isn't offensive to God, by the way. If John the Baptist can be at peak faith, and then I don't know if he's even the one, and right in the middle of that, Jesus goes, this is the greatest prophet that ever lived. You're going to be okay. That's the message I like to present to people. You're going to be fine, even if your faith kind of rides a roller coaster. I'm really excited for the Lord. Oh, I don't want to read my Bible. Oh, I want to tell everybody about Jesus. I'm not sure I believe in God. You know, that, <laughs> hopefully it doesn't swing that far. But even if it does... He, you still have a liaison. You st- and if, if God would have such faith, such, such uh, respect for the ministry of John the Baptist, then I think you're going to be okay. And so when John spots it, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And we've done this in our John series, but think about this again, because John 1 was a long time ago in our John series. I don't know, about your, I don't know what your revelation is of the love of God. I don't know how broad you think that is. I don't know how powerful, how all-encompassing you feel the redemptive nature of the blood of Jesus is. But to me, anything less than the sin of the world is an insult to the Lamb of God. Him taking anything less than the sin of the whole wide world is an insult to the finished work of Jesus. Never limit the sin-destroying power of the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. One of the great insults, and I, I've already qualified this by saying, thank God He rides out our roller coaster faith. I'll tell you what else. Thank God He rides out our roller coaster theology. All the stupid ideas we come up with that we present to people versus the moments when we actually nail something correctly. Thank God He's with us through all of that stuff. But... One of the great insults to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world is the modern church still obsessed with identifying sin every time they turn around. With making it the object of every prayer meeting, every Bible study, every song, every sermon, every altar meeting. To identify sin, to point out sin, to spot sin, to eliminate sin. And it would, you would think that the great chief goal of Christianity is to be the best at finding sin. That what you're supposed to be doing now that you're disciples of Christ is little sin sheriffs. Pointing it out everywhere that you can and alleviating people from it. And I think we need to have a revival again in our soul of behold, there was one lamb who took the sin of all of us, the whole wide world into himself. And that something powerful happens when we have a revelation of behold, the lamb of God that takes away sin. And here to me is where it gets pretty fascinating. All of that I think is amazing. God's provided himself a lamb. Hey, there's a lamb coming. Behold the lamb of God. 
Then the New Testament, and I opened this little lesson tonight with the idea that one image speaks for the whole. You know, like the American Eagle, he soars high, he's strong, he's beautiful. He's endangered. He's special on the earth. There's not a lot like him. You can do all of that. You don't want to peel too deep because then it starts looking bad. And, the, and there's things that you go, okay, well, that's not. But if same thing with the lamb. And you put that lamb out there. He's innocent. He's pure. He's spotless. He didn't do anything to bring this death upon himself. You would think that that image would remain the image in the forefront of the mind of the Bible. It's a very Old Testament image. There's sheep everywhere. Every time you turn around the Old Testament, somebody's killing a lamb or a bull or a pigeon or a goat. I mean, there's blood flowing everywhere. And behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And yet the lamb imagery almost disappears from New Covenant theology after Jesus. It's fascinating. In fact, it only resurfaces twice before the book of Revelation. One of them is where Philip is walking down a road the book of Acts. And he sees a guy sitting in a chariot. The guy is an Ethiopian eunuch who has somehow procured a physical copy of the scroll of the book of Isaiah. Within itself is a pretty phenomenal thing in the first century, that you have a scroll of anything. And yet he's holding a scroll, a Gentile, an Ethiopian, a eunuch, which holds a lot of connotations in the ancient world, a castrated male, sitting in his chariot, reading from a scroll. And Philip, who's just been preaching the gospel wherever he goes, walks by him and says, hey, what are you reading? And the man says, well, I need some help with it. I'm reading it, but I don't understand it. And he reads to him Isaiah 53, what we call verse 6 and 7, the verses we read earlier. And that's the only reference in that part of the New Testament to lamb. And it's a, it's a quote from the Old Testament. Philip jumps up in the chariot and goes, let me tell you about that lamb. And Philip in that story identifies the lamb as Jesus. There's, our, there's us pulling from the Old Testament into the new. And Philip goes, let me introduce you to the man named Jesus. And the Ethiopian eunuch accepts Jesus and is baptized in the river. And then Philip moves on to his next assignment. But even that is, is an Old Testament verse being pulled into a New Testament world. Deep into the canon of New Testament text, you get one verse, you get one image of lamb in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct, that was received by tradition from your fathers. That's a real fancy way of saying, you know, you were never going to get saved through your religion, the religion that dad and grandpa gave you. None of that stuff could redeem you. But you've been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Look at this. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And that's it. That's the only New Testament. Paul never uses the lamb imagery. Peter, the author of 1 Peter, uses as an image Jesus was like a lamb without a spot. So I, I say all of that for this reason. I think the New Testament ran the risk of changing its national symbol. The New Testament ran the risk of getting rid of the turkey. You know, because who wants to be represented by the turkey? We'd rather be represented by the eagle. The problem is, God shall provide himself a lamb. So then something quite remarkable happens. John gets imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos. And one Sunday morning, he wakes up and he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. And he has what we call the revelation. And we have so trashed the book of Revelation in the church that it holds almost no ability any longer to show us what it was designed to show us. We have so co-opted the book of Revelation as spiritual bullet points of modern day news headlines that we have missed the fact that the Bible tells us it was the unveiling, the apocalyptos is the Greek word, 
Apocalyptos does not mean apocalypse. That's an English invented word. Apocalypse meaning end of the world. In the Greek, apocalypto does not mean end of the world. Apocalypto means unveiling. The apocalyptus of Jesus is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And I began to wrestle with why did God at the end of the canon of Scripture in the New Testament feel as if He needed to unveil Jesus? We already had Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We've had the book of Acts. We have Paul. Paul does an amazing job of unveiling Jesus. Jesus in you. Jesus with you. Jesus near you. Jesus around you. Why do we need an unveiling of Jesus? Because we changed our national bird. We got filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. We saw the dead raised. We saw the power of God flowing. We saw Ethiopian eunuchs getting baptized and Gentiles getting saved. We watched Rome shake. We saw believers persecuted. We watched the blood flow of the martyrs and we believed that we, we, we should pre present power. I think what happens in the New Testament is that God takes a pause and goes, don't forget, I provide myself a lamb. In the book of Revelation, the lamb shows up 24 times. It's only 21 chapters long. It's the single most important image of the book of Revelation. If you ask Christians, what's the book of Revelation about? Bombs, dragons, antichrists, mark of the beast, end of the world. Chaos, governments collapse, one world order. No one will ever say to you, the book of Revelation is God's attempt to put your focus on the Lamb because He talks about the Lamb more than He talks about any of that other stuff. He talks about the Lamb all the time. He talks about the Lamb in nearly every chapter. He can't stop referring to the Lamb. What do I think the Holy Spirit's trying to say in this? Don't change the bird. Don't change the image of your faith. It's not anything else. It's not the fire of Pentecost. It's not the cross. It's not the empty tomb. It's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He doesn't cease to be the Lamb just because we've got this prestige. He doesn't cease to be the Lamb because we've got authority. We've silenced that picture of the Son of God on the earth in an hour where it's just not cool for the leader of your faith to be not only a lamb, Revelation really ratchets it up. Because God, when He needs to get His point across, He can't just show you it's a lamb. He has to go even farther into the image of the lamb. Look at Revelation 5, 5 and 6. One of the elders said to me, Don't weep. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and loose the seven seals. And I looked, and you know what I thought I would see? The lion of the tribe of Judah. I mean, why wouldn't you? You were just told that the lion's the one that's going to take care of stuff. Behold, I looked in the middle of the throne and the four living creatures. Look how it's building up the tension because you get to finally see the lion. That's what you want to see is the lion. And in the middle of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And you want to talk about one of the most disappointing reveals in the Bible. There it is. Hey, you know who's got this? The lion. You want to meet him? And that slow pan of the camera. And God does this to us on purpose in Revelation because we have lost the image of what saved us. And we run that risk today. So God wants to close the canon by reminding you of what you are. You want to know who your Savior is? He's not only a lamb. He's a lamb as if he were freshly slain. He's still bleeding for the, his enemies. He's fresh for redemption. The canon of Scripture doesn't want us to walk away from the image of the lamb. It wants us infatuated by the image of the lamb. But it's asking a lot, man. It's asking a lot because lambs can't, they're not cool. They're not powerful. They don't run anything. They're not leaders. They're not conquerors. They hunt nothing. It's way better to be the lion of the tribe of Judah. But what if the title, and we'll do a, we're going to do a message in this series on 
the lion, the lamb, but his title is lion, but his image is lamb because God wants you to know. He wants us to see that you can't silence this reality about God's victory. His victory happens at the open wound of a bleeding lamb. That's where Jesus wins. And it's where he still wins to this day. And I think it is quite remarkable that the New Testament, silent about a, a subject that is the subject of the Old Testament, the Lamb, is forced back into your consciousness in the book of Revelation. Almost like the Holy Spirit is jamming it down your throat in the book of Revelation. Lamb, 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 Lamb. Go do your own study and watch how many times it pops up. It's as if every time John turns around, he wants to be reminded, this is about a Lamb. This is about a lamb. This is about a lamb. Why? That's my question. Why? Because the lamb to Israel held inside of one lamb the collective representation of all of Israel. Jesus doesn't cease to be the lamb so that you'll never forget. He still holds inside of him the collective representation of, his whole, of the whole world. It's not just you, it's not just you and your spouse, it's not just you and your kids, it's not just you and your nation, it's the whole world represented in the man, Christ Jesus, the leader, the federal head of who we are. See Jesus as bleeding on your behalf. It makes the cross constantly real. It makes the cross constantly relevant. And it also keeps you from cutting your own self. If we don't have a revelation of a bleeding lamb, we're going to have a revelation something needs to bleed because we are blood-hungry people. It's in our nature. And the reason why the lamb is still bleeding in Revelation is because God knows that whenever the world turns to chaos, we'll look for blood to pay something back. And if we can see that the revelation of Jesus in heaven is that he is still bleeding, we might have the idea that he's bleeding on our behalf. Because the book of Hebrews says the blood of Christ speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Why does the Bible say the blood of Christ speaks better things than the blood of Abel? Because the blood of Abel is the first person in the Bible who had his blood shed. Remember, Cain killed his brother. His blood splashes down into the ground and it becomes the symbol of fleshly vengeance. Because you need somebody to avenge your death. The blood of Jesus speaks better things than the blood of Abel because the blood of Jesus, which is still flowing on our behalf, doesn't demand payback, doesn't demand vengeance. And if the blood of Jesus has been presented to the Father, then your blood doesn't need to be presented to the Father. If you can see the lamb in front of heaven as freshly slain, you'll stop hanging yourself on your own foolishness, your own guilt, your own shame, your own issues. You'll stop laying yourself out there as if you need to die, realizing that Christ has died on our behalf. If we silence the bleeding lamb in this hour, the only person left to bleed is our enemies. And if we don't kill our enemies, we kill ourselves in the midst of it. And I've been raised in a church culture of Christians hanging themselves on performance. Burned out, frustrated, mad, ticked off at God, gave up on it. I can't live for that God. I can't have anything to do with Him if this is the way God treats me. And you know what? I understand their pain. I get it. I've been in that boat. I've walked that road to say, if that's all there is to this, why would you keep living for God? I now say it to believers who won't admit that they're still frustrated at the fact that they're having to work so hard to hold on to their salvation. But I say to you, if God would go to this great a length to wrap himself in human flesh, become a man, live, die, resurrect, and ascend into heaven, he would go to that great length to take care of sin and then lose you on a technicality. Why would you serve that God? He loves you enough to show you you could be saved, but he doesn't love you enough to hold your hand in the middle of hell. And I don't believe that. That's why he's still bleeding in Revelation 5. His wounds aren't healed over. He's not scarred, reminding you of what happened. He's bleeding because you'll need it. He's bleeding so you'll remember you don't have to. He's bleeding so that when this gets difficult, you can say, it's as if he died for me today. It's not as if he died for me 2,000 years ago. It's as if he died for me today. Why would you need him to die for you today? Maybe because you had a bad day. Maybe because you did something stupid or if you're foolish. And maybe if you can see that revelation, if you can see that lamb, 
then you can be at rest in who you are. It never ceases to function separate from the image of the Lamb. And so the Bible wants to close the way it began. God shall provide himself a lamb. Here's his lamb, freshly slain. And I'll repeat it over and over and over in this final book so that you don't forget. God did this. You didn't. The body of the old covenant was God asking for a lamb from you. Give a lamb. And it wasn't enough that God asked you to pay for the lamb. At atonement, God asked you to love it. That's the body of the Old Testament. Remember me saying you take it in your house, hold it for four days, then kill it, then eat it? Like, we're eating, we're eating lamby. <laughs> yeah. The body of the old covenant is God asking it from you. The body of the new covenant is God asking nothing from you. He becomes the lamb. He is the one who lays his own love down. That's Christianity. That's the faith. Everything else is the traditions of the fathers. Everything else is that which doesn't set us free. What sets us free is the knowledge of that lamb. Now let's go back to our story. Because I want you to, I want to leave you with one. I think, I think actually I could leave you with the image of, of the book of Revelation hammering away at the lamb image for 24 times. And that's enough to go, wow, I need to go check that out. But I want to try to do even better because I think there's something in that story of Abraham walking up that mountain that should leave us with one very, very important image about God providing himself a lamb. Let's slowly work through Genesis chapter 22. Start in verse 1. We're going to work our way up through 14. Two of these verses we've already read, but these first several we have not. So watch the story unfold. Now it came to pass after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac. Isaac is not his only son. He has another son named Ishmael. So God is asking for the son of promise, not the son of flesh. The son of flesh is one that Isaac, that Abraham had because he slept with Hagar. The son of promise was the one that his wife was not able to conceive, but she did. So the first child could be looked at as the son of the natural, Ishmael. Isaac is the son of a miracle. I've got to protect the miracle. God asks for the miracle because God's asking for the one that Isaac could, or Abraham could do nothing about. And so he's asking for the chiefest. He's asking for that ultimate payment. Go back. The one you love, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him. And Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering. He rose, he went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, third day imagery starts in Genesis. It's going to be third day imagery as we walk the mountain. This was a prelude to third day imagery would be a resurrection. We're about to have a resurrection atop this mountain. At least that's Abraham's thinking. According to the book of Hebrews, he's walking up that mountain going, if I have to kill this kid, God's going to bring him back. He brought him to me once, he bring him to me twice. So third day image should not have been shocking when Jesus tells his disciples, I will die and on the third day be raised again. He was speaking to an Israel, to a Jewish audience who would have understood third day imagery. So the third day Abraham lifted his eyes, he saw a place far off, and Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, the lad and I will go yonder and worship and we'll come back to you. Abraham could have picked any spot. God didn't say go there, go there. Said, hey, walk for two days, walk for three. He went th third day, picks a spot. The lad and I are going to come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering. These are our verses we opened with. He laid it on Isaac, his son. He took the fire in his hand, he took a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Look, the fire of the wood, but where's the lamb for burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. And they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there, and he put the wood in order, and he bound Isaac, his son. He laid him on the altar upon the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. Double, double pronoun usage in Hebrew literature is always a pronouncement of affection. Abraham, Abraham. Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem. How often would I have pulled you in as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not let me. David screams it when he hears of his son Absalom. Absalom, Absalom. And so there's that, there's that double heart cry. 
that he always calls your name twice, by the way. He said, don't lay your hand on the ladder, do anything for now I know that you fear God since you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So now notice that Abraham said God will provide himself a lamb and yet we're going to get a ram, which is just the male gender of the same animal. So there, there could be a, you could probably make a Hebrew argument of, of gender inflection here being that the son of, it would be a son of God, not the daughter of God who would die. Either way, it could still be a lamb and a ram, all right? It could just be a young ram. That's just for those who are looking, if there's any inconsistency in the story. Abraham lifted his eye, he looked, behold, there was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Abraham went, took the ram, offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Now, it was, Aside from the fact that there are so many, and we hit a, several of them on our way in there, the third day imagery, and we, we hit the Lord to provide himself a lamb and the knife and the wood. I want to leave you with this thought. God provides himself a lamb, and he provides it in the middle of a world that you are going to be asked, that your part in this is that you're going to be asked to walk up a hill. All right? No matter what you're going through, no matter how tough no matter how difficult, no matter how you don't think you can climb it, you don't think you can handle one more step, one more day. The Father is walking your answer up the other side of the mountain you can't see. Because when Abraham got to the top of the mountain, waiting on him in the thicket was a ram he couldn't see on his way up the hill. Because God's walking your provision up the other side. Don't ever forget it. And the only way you're going to miss it is if you turn around and head back the other way. But if you'll walk into the middle of it, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you, he says. Do you know why we need to keep seeing the lamb? Because we're being asked to walk up a hill. We're all being asked to walk. You're being asked to walk up something. And God provides himself a lamb that's walking the other side and you can't see him. You want to know who's walking in the shadows when you don't see him? Your provision. Your slain lamb. He's waiting in the thicket. And I love, I want to leave you with the image that no matter what hell throws at you, no matter what you're going through, no matter what chaos you face, no matter what mountain you climb, no matter how much the thickets, no matter the thorns, no matter the bleeding, God's walking your answer up the other side because the, the message of the Bible is go on up the hill. I'm walking your provision. I'm going to meet you there. That's why we can't silence the lamb. We can't walk this hill without him. We just can't walk it without him. Let's loosen him. Father, what a powerful moment we've had feasting on lamb tonight, <laughs> enjoying this gorgeous image. It's bloody, and that means it's violent, but we know that the lamb is for us. We've walked this hill and we've struggled up it and the knowledge that you walked our answer up the other side we can't see is so great. That we, I don't even know what to do with it other than just say thank you. As we try to take the tape off the mouth of the lamb, we're not naive. We know no one can actually silence you. You're going to say what you say. But I'm asking you to help us take that tape off the mouth in our own consciousness in our own revelation and in our own understanding. We'll be better for it if we keep watching that lamb. You've provided him, we receive him, and we thank you for him. In the name of Jesus, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, we say amen.